My name is David Francis and I will be serving as your host and moderator today. Today we have a, a presentation by Dr. Vance Whitaker of the University of Florida. He will be speaking about the application of genomics to strawberry breeding. A PDF of his slide set is already posted to eextension.org. Since 2009, Dr. Whitaker has directed the strawberry breeding program at the University of Florida's Gulf Coast Research and Education Center, where he develops cultivars that are widely grown in West Central Florida and around the world. A hallmark of his program is collaborative research with a statewide team of specialists in the areas of genomics, pathology, production, and post-harvest biology. Now I'm going to switch control of the screen over to our speaker. Dr. Whitaker. Well, thank you, David. I appreciate that introduction, and thanks to everyone who's tuning in for the webinar today. Um, I will be discussing application of genomics to strawberry breeding today, uh, but before I get started on the presentation, um, I should acknowledge um, co-authors on this webinar, uh, Dr. Alan Chambers, Dr. Kevin Volta, Dr. Nala Basile, and Dr. Sujit Verma. Each of these authors has provided either figures or slides, and really what I'm presenting today is the results of a, a whole community of researchers collaborating in, in strawberry genomics and breeding, um, and so I want to give them their due um, acknowledgement. Today I'm going to give you a, a brief background of the talk and then uh, give my talk in three main sections. I'm going to talk about the application of genomics to fingerprinting for clone identification, the application of genomics to candidate gene discovery and marker development, and then uh, coming from the other direction, application of genomics to SNP genotyping and QTL detection. And really these three main sections of the talk also relate to uh, the main uses of markers in breeding. Uh, fingerprinting, for one, which is very important in IP protection and sorting out nursery stock issues, for instance, in strawberry, and also uh, de developing markers in the second and third pieces for marker-assisted seedling selection or marker-assisted parent selection. Um, I also want to be careful to acknowledge a much larger group of folks who contributed to the work that I'm talking about today. Not only uh, Alan, who is a former student of uh, co-advised by myself, and Kevin Folta, who is our strawberry genomics and molecular biologist stationed on campus in Gainesville, Florida. Um, Alan did uh, the bulk of the work presented in the first and second pieces of the presentation. And Dr. Sujit Verma, who is a current postdoc working with me, and Dr. Basile uh, focused on the third section of our talk today. And of course, I want to acknowledge a, a large group of folks with the Rosebreed Consortium, which is a, a large SCRI CAP project, a five-year project that was funded to enable marker-assisted breeding in the Rosaceae. Applications of genomics um, have been pretty slow in straw breeding, strawberry breeding up until now. Why has that been? The primary reason for that is that the cultivated strawberry is a highly heterozygous allo-octoploid. So its genetics are quite complicated. And uh, figuring out how to do mapping and genetic studies in that octoploid is quite daunting. But thankfully, I'll talk about some resources that are allowing us to make progress in that area. Uh, in addition, be because of the difficult uh, genetic complexities of cultivated strawberry. Genomic resources have been limiting, and also uh, money has been uh, limiting in a specialty crop such as strawberry. Part of that is due to the fact that germplasm in strawberry is pretty highly divergent across regions, and so different breed breeders in different areas are awful, all, oftentimes working with fairly unique sets of germplasm. Finding tools that work across all those are, are, are challenging as well. Um, just as a very brief background on uh, this octoploid I've been talking about, um, cultivated strawberry is uh, a hybrid between two octoploid wild progenitors, Fregaria chiloensis, uh, 
uh, and Fregaria virginiana. Fregaria chilensis uh, clones and accessions were collected from Chile in South America and accidentally hybridized in European botanical gardens with Fregaria virginiana, which had been collected from the east coast of North America and uh, generated what we enjoy today as the Fregaria ananas or the cultivated strawberry. Now, um, thankfully, we have some, some new resources that has really jump-started, has really kick-started uh, applications of genomics breeding in strawberry. And the first was the 2011 publication of the strawberry reference genome, which is Fregaria vesca, uh, a diploid ancestor of uh, the current uh, octopoid strawberry, or at least a vesca-like progenitor is known to be one uh, contributor to the octopoid genome cultivated strawberry. Also, just the, the simple fact that uh, uh, over time, high throughput DNA and RNA sequencing technologies continue to become cheaper and better. And today, I will give you an example of what we've done with RNA sequencing. And finally, uh, the development of high throughput whole genome uh, genotyping platforms such as the Axiom Array that I'll be talking about today. Now, um, I think it may help to give a little bit of background on the breeding process in strawberry for those who may be tuning in that, that are not working in strawberry. Uh, strawberry is a great model for the Rosaceae because it has a fast generation time. Um, and we can do a cycle of uh, crossing uh, in, uh, in, in one year uh, in annual strawberry culture like we have here in Florida. So from crossing to seed germination uh, and then summer nursery where we, where we develop runners off of seedlings and create clonal replicates of seedlings for ultimate evaluation of clonal trials. Um, really the evaluation stage at the far right is the real limiting step of how fast we can cycle new material back in as parents. And so uh, we really what we have is a, as a fast cycle recurrent selection program for breeding. Uh, we keep track of pedigrees, it is pedigree breeding. But um, we want to use a marker assisted selection uh, to make our program uh, more efficient. Uh, and to put the best material out in the field for evaluation we can. In the next slide here, I've shown you some uh, examples of um, Florida strawberry varieties and a visual of what annual strawberry culture looks like in Florida, which is very similar to how things are done in many other parts of the world and places like Southern California. But we have many traits in strawberry that are important, and that is significant when thinking about breeding and genomic applications because uh, you can see that we have a number of different fruit traits that are important, whether they be appearance traits, fruit chemistry traits, flavor traits, and other physical traits like fruit size, firmness, and, and shelf life. We also have a number of agronomic traits of yield and yield distribution plant architecture, and of course disease resistance traits. So any impact that we can make to enrich our breeding populations for certain traits that we want is, is a big help because that's one less trait that we have to consider in a complex mixture of, of traits that are, that are important in strawberry. So now let me get into part one and I'll be talking about applications of genomics to fingerprinting for a clone identification. Uh, the work that I'm going to be talking about is published and can be read in much finer detail in this article in Molecular Breeding entitled, A Genome-Enabled High Throughput and Multiplexed Fingerprinting Platform for Strawberry. Uh, this was spearheaded by uh, Kevin and my student, uh, Dr. Alan Chambers. And the goal of this work was we wanted to develop a uh, very quick but very reliable and high throughput system for clone identification for purposes of IP protection, uh, but also for uh, uh, any uh, uses that we would have within the strawberry program of making sure that we've correctly identified clones. Because again, we are a clonal uh, 
cultivar crop that's vegetatively propagated. Um, and so what we wanted to do was uh, to stack multiple primer pairs for SSR amplification into a single reaction and fragment analysis. And we used the Fregaria Vesca reference genome as a tool to help us do this. This uh, figure shows uh, 927 different SSR features that were identified in the reference genome. The y-axis shows the number of SSR loci identified in different categories represented along the x-axis. These, these bars on the x-axis represent the repeat size, in other words, how many tandem repeats, um, or the, re the repeat size of the SSR feature. So for instance, uh, a repeat of GCTT, GCTT would be, have four base pairs in the repeat unit. And the colors in the bars represent the number of those tandem repeats that were found in the reference genome. So why is this information important? Well, uh, ideal candidates would have a large number of repeat units so that we could have a, a number of different polymorphic alleles identified. And also, we wanted the SSR features to be at least um, four base pairs or more. And the reason for that is that it reduces stutter bands in the fragment analysis, and it also just gives size separation in the fragment analysis to clarify allele calls. So we wanted it to be this to be a very reproducible, repeatable, and uh, uh, clear allele calls, while also uh, giving us a lot of information in one fragment run. So what we did is we we were looking for the best SSR features. Uh, we developed primary pairs that, that amplified a number of them. Uh, we wanted them to produce lots of polymorphic data, but we wanted the allele range to be over a fairly small fragment size so that we could uh, stack them easily into a multiplexing platform. Ultimately, we came up with eight candidates on three different linkage groups that, that produced the highest quality data among a, an initial diverse set of um, octopoid strawberry genotypes, ones that produced a lot of alleles, up to eight different alleles at a given loci, again, as we're working in an octoploid. And then uh, what Alan did was to redesign the primers to target the amplicons of each primer set to distinct size ranges that didn't overlap, so they could all be scored in one reaction. So we combined those eight primer pairs into a single PCR reaction and visualize them using a secondary labeling with a, a, a fluorophore. And at the end of the process, we compared the multiplex reactions to each primer pair run in single reactions to make sure that there was fidelity um, uh, across uh, the multiplexing platform. Here is an example of uh, uh, ABI output for the fragment analysis for uh, the festival cultivar um, in a single PCR reaction with this multiplexed set. And what you can see is patterns of alleles that are targeted to six different size ranges, for instance, 300 to 350 base pairs, 400 to 450, and so on. We fingerprinted over 200 different Fregaria accessions to test uh, this platform. And this is uh, basically a uh, a digitized representation of the results. On the left uh, column, we have uh, cultivated strawberry uh, parent one, uh, parent two, which is a cultivar called Radiance, and then one of the progeny. So we were able to compare a number of closely related individuals. Then we also have uh, two Fregaria chiloensis accessions, two Virginiana accessions, and a couple of diploid uh, for Gary Vesca accession. So the exciting thing was that uh, this platform worked very well across a lot of diverse material. One of the things we also wanted to make sure is that it didn't work just in diverse material, but it also worked very well to distinguish closely related individuals. So here is a, tr a tree of uh, 
representing results where we took uh, some closely related parents within our most elite breeding material and some of the crosses among them. Uh, so basically we were able to look at full siblings, uncles, aunts, parents versus siblings and we were able to clearly identify um, each of these individuals um, every time with this uh, uh, platform. So this, uh, we believe this platform um, has a number of applications. It certainly has in our breeding program and can for other breeding programs as well. So we've used it to sort out mix-ups in grower fields. Sometimes we have growers that, that order certain cultivars and they say, wait a minute, this doesn't look right, what is this? And we're able to help them out with that, both in growing fields in our own breeding nursery and in commercial nurseries. Uh, and in the uh, National Clonal Germplasm Repository, um, it has identified a number of some accessions that need to be looked at in terms of uh, they may not be the correct, correctly labeled. Um, we can use them across highly related or diverse germplasm, across species, across hoity levels. This um, platform works very, very well. So um, we definitely are, uh, can use it for IP protection, and um, we can use it for diversity analysis. And if you uh, care to look at that original publication, we do that um, for the over 200 Fregaria accessions that we have fingerprinted. So that uh, sums up part one. And let me move on to part two, which is application of genomics to candidate gene identification and marker development. So this is the strategy where we, where we look at candidate genes for certain traits and hope to move from candidate gene to a robust, robust molecular marker that can be used in breeding. What I'm going to talk about today here in the second section has also been published as as in the first section. Just recently, actually, in uh, BMC Genomics, again, Alan is the uh, primary researcher and first author on this work. Um, and in this work, we, we looked at um, a gene involved in flavor, particularly for a volatile compound. Um, recently, we have been focusing some of our efforts on volatile compounds and their influence on flavor. Um, We've identified some compounds that we think uh, impact flavor uh, in strawberry quite a bit. And we're interested in these because uh, volatile compounds and, and other chemicals involved in flavor are really ideal candidates for marker-assisted selection because volatile phenotyping by GMC, GCMS is very expensive, very slow, and cumbersome. And so if we can take a complex, low heritability trait like flavor and strawberry and break it into some components that we know are important and, and look at those via markers, we feel like that can be a good tool to help us make some uh, progress. So the approach that we used is something that we called uh, dubbed transcriptome sorting. And in the first step of this, uh, what we did is to use GCMS to identify some potential parents that have presence and absence of particular fruit volatiles. So in this case, um, the uh, parent listed on the left would be, uh, would be able to produce volatile A, but could not produce, uh, the other parent could not produce volatile A. And so we did some volatile phenotyping to be able to identify some of these cases in which a volatile was completely absent in some of the parental germplasm, uh, a volatile that uh, we want to have in our cultivars. And then we simply cross these two parents exhibiting the different volatile profiles and then score their progeny for the volatile. And we always uh, score by uh, making multiple harvests, usually at least three harvests in a given season since volatiles can, can be quite variable depending on environmental conditions. But essentially what we do is try to identify a certain set, usually about 20 individuals that are segregating for multiple volatiles at one time. So in this example, we have progenies one through five. One and two are present for volatile A and, ab and three through five are absent and so forth. In the third step, 
what we do is we div, uh, do harvest and divide fruit samples between GCMS analysis and then uh, take the other half of multiple fruit of each progeny and prepare them for uh, RNA sequencing. So we're using in this case RNA seq on the parents and the select set of segregating individual progeny. And the transcriptome sorting, as we call it, is really kind of a selective genotyping or selective sequencing, or, or you could even call it like a bulk segregant seeking, sequencing approach, where we're simply looking for at batches of uh, RNA sequence barcoded according to the genotype, and we're able to sort uh, and match and look for potential candidates that could be involved. Involved. So basically, we're we're computationally merging the transcriptome data into producers and non-producers. We can uh, this this process can be very flexible. We can compare parents to each other. We can compare parents to each progeny in turn, or do it by bulks. Um, it's a very um, um, flexible process. Now you can imagine that in this process with um, small numbers of genotypes, say 20 segregating progeny, that you're going to have a, a number of false positives. You're going to have a number of uh, expressed uh, genes that are showing up that may not actually be involved in the process. So once we've narrowed down to a set, a set of potential candidates using this process, what do we do to validate some of these uh, candidate genes that come out of the analysis? Well, there's actually several things that we can do in the case of volatiles, and that's why volatile uh, analysis in fruit has, has probably been successful for us. One of the things that we can do is that for volatiles that we know are accumulate with ripening, and most do, at least if they're positively correlated with uh, flavor, is that we can do QRT-PCR uh, in a fruit ripening series to see whether the volatile and the candidates that we're interested in um, are accumulating with ripening. If they pass that test, we can also look at the presence or absence of the volatile and the transcript in a number of different environments uh, because uh, volatile production does depend on environments within the same parent or same set of parents. And if we have a pass in that regard, we can go to the broader germplasm and look at presence and absence of the volatile and larger germplasm and the presence and absence of the candidate gene. Now, um, in this case, uh, for what's published in this report, we were looking at a volatile called amidecolactone, which is also important in peach. And in strawberry, it gives a nice fruity, uh, sweet kind of uh, uh, odor or flavor. Uh, when eaten, and it's present in high concentrations in some of the uh, most uh, highly flavored cultivars that we have in our program. The cross was between a Florida cultivar called Eliana and, and a French cultivar called Mara de Bois, and Eliana was the producer for Gamma Decalactone, and Mara was the non-producer. And this just shows abundance of Gamma Decalactone uh, across uh, GCMS analysis that were conducted from three different harvests within a season. And we got a number of different patterns of accumulation among a number of the segregating progeny. But most importantly, we got a number that had, uh, uh, that were just completely undetectable in all three harvests. So we were clearly able to identify presence and absence. This is the, the minimal set of segregating genotypes that we identified. And so you can see there are a number of non-producers on the left and others that produce moderate to high amounts of, on the right. And you can see the parents, Eliana and Mara, listed there. So our RNA-seq data came from this set. And after doing the transcriptome sorting approach and the validation approaches, here was uh, a summary of the results. In the Fregaria Vesca reference genome, there are about 34,000 predicted genes, 17,000 of which have some transcript evidence. Between our two parents, Eliana and Mara, we detected 2,200 genes that were differentially expressed. 
but after doing uh, the sorting uh, of the transcripts, we really came up with one uh, gene candidate that was validated using QT RT PCR through uh, fruit ripening and environmental series. Um, and uh, then we were able to develop a molecular marker within that genic sequence um, that uh, segregated perfectly with the phenotype in a number of uh, F1 and BC1 progenies. And so what was really exciting is that this one candidate, which is a, a putative fatty acid desaturase, um, was the candidate and uh, primer pairs uh, did not amplify, uh, a number of different primary pairs did not amplify in this region in non-producers, which selected basically in non-producing genotypes there's a deletion perhaps or a, a large insertion or something of that nature um, in this gene. And so then we were easily able to just design primers in the genic region to develop a functional marker uh, for this uh, candidate gene. The one that I just mentioned that we validated in a number of progenies. So here's uh, just a visual of this uh, marker. So uh, the bottom band is a control band uh, from another primer set that's introduced into each PCR reaction as a control. The upper band is the diagnostic band that indicates presence or absence uh, of the ability to produce the uh, volatile gamma decalactone. And we see that in where we get only control band, these uh, individuals are non-producers. And where we have the uh, top band, we have producers. And we have um, assayed this marker in populations as well as even in wild species and a large panel of cultivated materials that we have phenotyped. And in every case that we have found, um, this marker segregates perfectly with the phenotype. So to summarize um, our results, we, we basically have developed a, a rapid identification of a candidate gene for gamma decalactone production using transcriptome sorting. We validated it using a fruit, fruit ripening and environmental series. And we ended up with a, a robust gene-based marker that, that really works well across a broad germplasm, which is pretty exciting. The, one of the nice advantages of the transcriptome sorting approach is that if your minimal set of individuals that you have both RNA-seq and phenotype data on is segregating for multiple volatiles, um, you can simply resort the RNA-seq data set using the barcoding um, to, to do the same thing with the same data set. So if chosen appropriately, the, this can be a very efficient approach. And in fact, our set um, was actually um, intentionally designed to also be segregating some other volatiles. And so we are continuing this work with other volatiles right, right as we speak. Of course, one limitation that you can probably gather of this approach is that it's really going to work best with presence-absence phenotypes. In other words, small quantitative differences between volatile production um, uh, this approach is probably not going to work very well for that. It's going to work best for single dominant genes that confer presence or absence of a particular volatile or, or if broadened to a, a particular trait, disease resistance trait or what have you. Um, but, you know, in terms of volatiles, um, we feel like this the, the volatile targets that tend to be um, highly present and absent in our breeding germplasm is really where we can make the most bang for our buck anyway, where we have volatiles that are clearly absent in portions of our germplasm, but they are desirable and we want to increase the frequency of the ability to produce those volatiles. And so those are the, the targets that we're going after in a, as, as a first step. So with that, I'll conclude part two um, of the webinar. And finally, I want to um, address part three, which is um, coming at uh, markers from a different angle, and that would be SNP genotyping and QTL discovery. And as you'll see, there's a big genomics application towards uh, this SNP genotyping. Uh, the Rosebreed project, which I mentioned before, uh, 
has as one of, has one of its very important goals the development of high throughput genotyping platforms, which were to also developed for crops like apple, peach, uh, and uh, and cherry. Uh, and we also developed one. I say we now Basile primarily and her group uh, developed a 90k uh, SNP chip. Uh, via Affymetrics and it was released in October of last year and the focus of this array was on ploidy reduction. Uh, obviously we have to have some way um, to focus on SNPs that are segregating in a diploid fashion and it utilized a SNP detection panel uh, of nine diverse octoploid genotypes uh, which were uh, important founders in uh, cultivated strawberry germplasm and important founders from different major breeding programs were included at the University of Florida. We um, submitted uh, two important founders for our program as well. This is an example of um, axiom SNP allele calling for different levels of allopolyploidy um, for uh, arrays that have been developed by API. On the left you can see um, SNP clustering for diploid river buffalo, allotetraploid rapeseed, on the right, further to the right, allohexaploid wheat, and then finally, octoploid strawberry. You can see that as we increase um, in uh, ploidy level, the clusters become closer together, but yet for you know high quality uh, SNPs, we can cluster BB, AB, and AA. Uh, basically the homozygous, heterozygous, and the other homozygous class of genotypes um, uh, pretty well using this approach. Now in order to effectively diploidize the genotype or, or find a number of SNPs that are homozygous, and let me go back, in other words homozygous AAAA or NAA in the other three subgenomes and only segregating in one of the octopoid subgenomes, a lot of uh, genomics and, and bioinformatics went into the SNP design um, by Nala and her group. Um, just SNPs that were uh, developed based on the Fregaria Vesca uh, genome sequence, it, as it turned out, um, without any uh, real pipelining to focus on diploid SNPs, about 29% of those SNPs ended up being diploid uh, anyway. Um, other uh, reduced ploidy approaches that were employed that um, increased that to a 61% of diploid SNPs detected. Um, and these were approaches such as um, looking for insertions and deletions, usually small insertions and deletions of about six base pairs. When comparing the nine um, genotypes that were on the SNP detection panel to the Fergaria Vesca genome. In other words, targeting SNPs that may be segregating in one subgenome and there's a deletion or an insertion at that same homeologous locus and the other three subgenomes such that the probe will only interrogate the one subgenome. And so that obviously it was um, successful compared to just the random approach of designing SNPs to find diploid SNPs. But there was a, a third approach that was surprisingly effective, and that was what is called the SNP, SNP approach to SNP design, where 80% of SNPs that were designed turned out to be segregating uh, in a diploid manner or scored in a diploid manner. And this is really pretty interesting, so I want to uh, show you how this was done. And this was really intriguing to me when I uh, was talking to Nala and figuring out how this was done. So in this approach, um, I'm shown um, four subgenomes in four different colors here. So we have uh, red, green, purple, and blue. And so because we're an octopoid, we can have, um, you know, we have basically eight, uh, a possibility of up to eight different um, alleles at a, at a particular locus. But here we're focusing on the target SNP, which is the one on the right, which I've shown for this hypothetical example to be um, homozygous or heterozygous in each subgenome for, for 
T and G SNP. Okay. But uh, the SNP SNP approach uh, basically is looking for target SNPs that are in close proximity, three or six base pairs, from a non target SNP, uh, which can be used for the ploidy reduction strategy. So in this case, what we would do is we would design a probe that would only anneal where there is a G at the non-marker SNP locus, and then would interrogate the SNP locus on the right. So in this case, as you can see, this probe would only bind to uh, sequences within one of the subgenomes, and therefore we would be uh, only looking at segregation on the one uh, subgenome in red. Uh, another hypothetical example, in this case, what if we have uh, the G at the non-marker SNP in two of the different subgenomes? So we can still get diploid segregation. Uh, in this case, a probe would anneal to both the, the red and green subgenomes but it only so happens that the SNP is segregating in the red sub subgenome, and thus we would get uh, diploid scoring and diploid segregation of that particular SNP. So that is the, the SNP-SNP method for SNP design for reducing effective ploidy limit. So uh, uh, out of uh, about, there were, there were about 21,000 markers uh, out of the 90,000 markers on this initial chip that were categorized as um, um, high poly-resolution SNPs that um, are robust um, and uh, the cl they cluster very well with, with a high confidence in SNP calling. And about 6,600 of those uh, SNPs uh, were um, uh, turned out to be polymorphic in a, a biparental mapping population holiday by Corona that was uh, developed by Eric van de Beg at Wageningen in the Netherlands. And Eric was able to map uh, all of these uh, SNPs to uh, this octopoid segregating population. So uh, what we see here is we say essentially the diploidization of this, the octopoid genome such that here we have uh, chromes uh, linkage group 1A 1B, 1C, and 1D, so rep representing one homeologous group, um, but representing the fact that we have bivalent pairing within each of the four subgenomes, and therefore we have four sub-linkage groups, and on and on through the, the total of the seven homeologous groups. So essentially uh, what this showed is that we've, we've transformed a, an allo-octopoid for mapping purposes into a diploid with all of these uh, SNPs that are segregating in a, in a diploid fashion. So this is just really, really exciting because now we have a tool uh, to really give us higher density um, SNP maps. So again, this is 6,600 of the 21,000 uh, markers that fell into the, the high quality class. So now as a breeder, I look at this and think, okay, how are we going to now utilize this for QTL detection and ultimately for marker development and breeding? And one of the questions that I, that I, that I ask is, okay, um, I know that, that I don't want to simply do QTL detection within a couple of biparental mapping populations, at least not for my breeding program, because it's a, a large, diverse uh, set of germplasm, and I want QTLs that I detect to be a relevant um, through at least a large portion of my breeding program. Uh, this is an example of a mating, a typical mating design that we would use in a given year. The genotypes on the left of the parents here are not particularly uh, important that you see, and I realize the text is small that you see what those are. But you know, in a typical year, we would use 20 to 25 elite parents and, and do some of our crosses in a, in a circular diallel mating design like this so that we can facilitate uh, quantitative genetic parameters uh, development and breeding values and so forth. And we might take uh, 10 to 15 individuals from each of these 100 families, each represented by the X's there in the cross combinations, and plant those out and do a lot of phenotyping to do progeny testing and, and develop breeding values for these, these parents that we've used and, and 
progeny down the road. So how do we do QTL analysis in populations sets like this um, that are very different from traditional you know, bifrontal mapping populations? Well, thankfully, there is software out there that allows us to do that, and that's where Dr. Verma comes in. Um, FlexQTL is a QTL um, uh, 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 analysis program that was developed by uh, Marker Bank and his associates at, at Wageningen. And basically, we can put our SNP genotypic data and all the phenotypic data that we're developing in our breeding trials on all those uh, diverse populations from that mating design and do uh, basically pedigree-based QTL analysis. It also works very well if you just have a large pedigreed set of individuals in a breeding program, which is a very realistic scenario for a strawberry breeding program. And you want to look at all that diverse uh, pedigree-linked material and do a, do a pedigree-based analysis for QTL detection. So we can, we can detect those QTLs. We can define functional haplotypes for those QTLs and eventually get to developing genetic tests for breeding. I wanted to give you an example of some of the things that have been done using QTL um, uh, or FlexQTL by Suji and others uh, with these SNP markers from the new platform. So the first thing that was done was to just do marker checks, so to look at identity by descent and ask the question, are these markers segregating as they should be uh, with uh, few errors uh, in, a, in a set of given germplasm. So in this case, we're looking at a segregation of five SNP markers um, in holiday corona and some of their progeny. So FlexQTL has been run to basically do an inheritance uh, check on each marker to look at potential errors. And the initial results of doing this in a set of 260 pedigree linked individuals is that 97% of the markers tested, or 97% of the 21,000 markers um, uh, thus far, segregate properly without any errors based on pedigree. So that's, that's a really good result. So then we move on to actual QTL analysis. We, we as I said, have 260 pedigree linked materials uh, that were part of the rose breed germplasm that are very diverse but are pedigree linked. Uh, they span multiple breeding programs and multiple generations. But an initial QTL analysis was done on those using the SNP uh, data, the, uh, the 6,600 initially mapped SNPs for which we have map locations. Uh, and here's an example for titratable acidity. And we have on in the middle, you can see that high peak a significant QTL for titratable acidity on linkage group 4D. Uh, if you look at the y-axis, anything above about a 0.1 probability is considered a significant QTL and flex QTL. And this particular QTL explains approximately 10% of the phenotypic variants among that diverse set of germ germplasm. Also, just to illustrate the functional haplotyping feature of flex QTL, um, Suji developed uh, this visual, uh, which predicts the uh, QTL alleles and genotypes at that particular locus. So here you, you can look at uh, big Q, big Q, little Q, little Q, and the heterozygote, and basically have a prediction for all the pedigree-linked individuals of what their QTL genotype is at that locus. So that is particularly helpful and important for designing the actual genetic tests that will be used in breeding. So just to summarize uh, section three, um, it's, it's really amazing how the bioinformatics pipeline and the use of the uh, sequenced individuals was so key to effectively reducing ploidy and uh, being able to identify SNPs that are segregating in a diploid manner. Uh, in the end, we have 21,000 high-resolution SNPs now uh, that show that diploid clustering. Uh, we, uh, uh, 6,000, uh, about 600 or so, were initially mapped in one population that happened to be polymorphic within that population. Uh, we've shown that they're segregating uh, according uh, properly, not just in that mapping population, but in a broad, diverse set of pedigree material. 
and we've even done some initial QTL analyses uh, using Plex QTL. And as far as next steps with the array, uh, we've uh, sent off, um, uh, uh, getting ready to send off a large number of materials uh, for genotyping on the array that represents breeding populations like the one I illustrated to you. And so we're raring to go and excited about that. Just to summarize the entire webinar, um, it's really exciting that we have these new approaches and tools, whether they be candidate gene approaches or the SNP platform, that I think are really going to allow a lot of applications to gen and genomics to breeding the strawberry finally in, in a big way. Uh, these can, the tools can be used in fingerprinting, marker assisted seedling selection, marker assisted parent selection. Um, just this spring, for the first time, we're using the gamma decalactone marker in seedling selection in about 8,000 seedlings. Um, so we're really getting our feet wet um, with uh, using that PCR-based marker uh, in a big way in our breeding program. And in terms of next steps, um, we're excited to use the QTL analysis to undercover, uncover some genomic architecture of, uh, or genetic architecture, I should say, rather, of some important traits. We have a number of different disease resistance and fruit quality traits, phenotypes uh, in these populations where we really don't know anything yet about the uh, genetic architecture of those traits. We, we know in general what the uh, heritabilities are of these traits, that many of them are polygenic traits, but we don't really know much about genetic architecture of these five or fewer genes, a hundred or more genes, and so we're really excited to to, to see what's going on there using FlexQTL. Um, in the future, we really hope to reduce the cost of the whole genome SNP scans, um, either by developing next generation arrays, many arrays that can be used for breeding applications or looking at sequence-based um, SNP detection methods. Uh, and we're, we're also interested in even testing some genomic selection methodologies now that we have higher density markers that that, that can be run on training populations and selection populations, hopefully to try to use strawberry as, as a little test case for some genomic selection methodology to see how that might work for crops and rosacea. With that, I believe I've talked long enough and I'm uh, happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, very good. Um, so thank you for joining us again, Vance. Thank you for your presentation. And thank you to the audience for coming. That concludes our webinar.